Great to see all of you here. Welcome. Um, really excited to, to be here. Hopefully you're all excited as I am. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about AI ethics. Um, so who, I am, who am I? My name is Ituro Laini. I work the data science and analytics manager at Principality. And when I'm not doing that, since I've got lots of free time, I'm also doing a part-time PhD at King's College London. And what I'm doing there is looking at um, the ethical implications of AI. So I thought, you know, we'll have a chat about that today. So yeah, we're going to talk about what this AI thing is, um, why, um, you know, ethical, what are the ethical implications, why it happens, why you should care about it. And I'm also going to give you some tools later on in how to deal with um, these issues. And then we'll have some final thoughts later on. So if my clicker works, um, first of all, we're just going to go through some key terms. So throughout the course of this talk, I'm going to be using the words ML and AI interchangeably. And whilst they're not identical for the purposes of what we're doing here right now, that's fine. We're just going to treat them as identical. It's, 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 it's fine. This talk is really aimed at a lay audience. So that's okay. I'm going to use the term FS a lot, stands for financial um, services. That's the industry I work in. And I've done a few talks around that industry and some examples relate to that. But most of it will be relevant to which industry you work in. So let's talk a bit about this, um, the background. So what's AI, what's ML? We use it every day, we can get away from it. When you log into Netflix and it tells you you should watch this or watch that, you know, that's an ML algorithm trying to recommend something to you. Um, same things being used in like your emails to kind of get rid of um, mails that aren't useful. Um, in the FS industry where I work in, um, AI, ML is being used quite a bit. That adoption is only set to increase, you know, it's going up day in, day out. So this is why, you know, we're kind of interested to understand what could the implications of this mean. Um, they're mostly used in what we call back office operations. So these are um, applications that don't really affect a customer per se. So they are hidden away. They're using like the operational side of things. But we know that as time goes on, they're soon going to move more and more into more what we call front office applications, which are things that impact directly you and I. So things like loan applications, etc., etc. So I'm going to give you a few examples of what we call bias in ML. And I'm going to show you quite a few examples because I want you to come away from this not thinking that, oh, maybe it's just like one-off weird examples, but to give you a real sense of um, issues that can occur. So, I, and most of you, a lot of you may ha will have heard a few of these examples already. So a few years ago, um, Amazon hiring algorithm was trying to identify who should be um, employed as engineers and it was um, picking males um, disproportionately because that's what it thought a good an engineer should look like. Um, there's also some um, a, um, research that has shown that, you know, Google's um, algorithm would um, at one point used to show more executive job adverts to users if it perceived or if it thought the user was a, a male. And we saw a few years ago with the A-levels when the results came out and we found out that um, people from lower income um, areas were disproportionately affected. Also in America, um, AI ML is being used to decide how long people can, um, people will um, s serve a, a prison <laughs> sentence. And also some work has been done that shows that that has discriminatory um, impact as well. Vision, 
facial recognition. There's a ton of work that's been done in this area, which shows that um, some applications can do not recognize some groups of um, people as well as others. And of course, if that technology is being used in a car, then maybe the car doesn't see you and is more likely to drive over you as well. It's also seen examples with names, how some names are perceived or thought to be a certain way over other names and same thing with healthcare industry as well. When patients present with the same symptoms, algorithms can give them very different propensities or very different risk depending on their ethnicity. So with these examples in mind then, let's then talk about why do these things happen? Why do we get these algorithms that behave this way or give these outcomes? But before we do that, I want to talk a bit about fairness because that's going to give us some context. So what's the definition of fairness? Essentially, what it's to treat somebody without any discrimination, right? So ensuring that um, people get the right outcome. Now, that's not a very easy thing to define because um, it's a subjective thing, right? What I think is a fair outcome, was I, what I think is the right outcome is very different from what you might think is the right one. So it's something that we are grappling with because it's very difficult to define what fair is. But we can think about in terms of measurement, in terms of two broad ways. We talk about what we call group fairness, which is essentially what's the outcome for one group versus what's the outcome for an, an, another group. For example, if I ask you all in this room to, you know, go through some kind of activity and, and group you guys, I might say, right, people on the left hand side, what results did they get? People on the right hand side, what results did they get? And I can assess both and that's your group fairness. Group fairness is one method we use. It's has its advantages in that it's easy to measure, it's easy to observe, but it doesn't take into account legitimate differences in groups. And there are times where there's legitimate reasons why groups can have different outcomes. Um, but we also think about individual fairness, which takes away that group belong, that group responsibility and says, well, if you and I are identical in terms of the characteristics for this activity, then we both get a similar outcome, right? Doesn't matter which group, doesn't matter if you're on the left-hand side of the room or on the right-hand side of the room, we should both get a, a similar outcome. Um, point of emphasis here, and if you take nothing away from this talk, I think this is one points that we need to really deal with because I think it's misconstrued a lot. When we talk about fairness in terms of ML and AI, it's not about just artificially giving one group a better outcome than another. What we are trying to deal with is whereas a candidate or an observation or an entity should otherwise be eligible for a certain outcome but the algorithm does not give it that outcome which it deserves because it belongs to a certain group. This is what we are talking about. It's not about giving undeserving groups or undeserving candidates a certain outcome. So going back to the Amazon hiring algorithm, it's not about saying a female is here, so let's just give her the job. No, what we're saying is if there is a, a female who is identical to a male and the male gets the job, then maybe she should also get the job. You know, it's about that individual fairness, that like for like. So now that we've seen what fairness is, we can start to think about why we're the sources of bias comes from. And there's three main, three main areas where it comes from. The data sets incoming, um, there's a lot of research done on this area. So the incoming data that we use to build our models can have a huge impact on the fairness outcome. 
And the reason for that is just broadly two different types of um, issues you can see. The bias in terms of the application that you use it for. So what I mean by this is you need to ensure that the data you use to train your model is representative of the, of the environment that your model is going to run. So if you train a self-driving car to drive in, in country A and you employ it to drive in country B, it might not do very well. So even though your data set that was used to train it is great and your training methodology was great, it might not work favorably. The other thing also is your data might be good and representative of the real world, but the real world is not perfect. So again, going back to the Amazon hiring <laughs> algorithm, um, if historically all it saw were that engineers are, are men, guess what? Your algorithm is going to think man equals engineer or engineer equals man. So that's one of the things we need to take into account. The other areas, not too much research has been done into this. These are some of the areas I'm working on. Bias from algorithms. Essentially, not all algorithms are equal and that's not very clear why. And it's not quite sure, not quite clear whether it's down to the way they are, are tuned or if it's something inherent in there going on. But early work shows that different algorithms give you vastly very different results. So when you're playing around with different things, just have a think about they might not treat everybody equally. Um, the other aspect to think about is the data manipulation. As data um, analysts, scientists, the first thing we do is we wrangle, uh, wrangle a lot of <coughs> data. So we're constantly transforming data, deleting observations, upsampling, downsampling encoding all sorts and whatever we do if we touch that data we could be unintend um, un intentionally introducing some form of a, a, a bias in there so it's just something to be aware of and that bit is not really talked about quite a lot but yeah there's some research on that which i'm also working on okay so now that you know all this, you know all the issues, why should you care about it? Um, there's two main reasons. Um, responsibility. So let's have a think about this. What happens if Netflix gets your movie recommendation wrong? Right? Okay. So one of two things. You might watch, you might end up having to watch something and you think, blimey, that's one hour of my life I'm never gonna get back. Or you might miss out on watching something and you turn up to work and everybody's going on about squid games and you're the only one who hasn't watched it. So really, those are the extremes, right? I'd like to think. Now what happens if a bank gets your loan decision wrong? That's a bigger problem, isn't it? It's not the same impact. So we've got to be responsible. Another key point of emphasis here is to think about what we're seeing. Sometimes you might be in a room with people from different industries and the cool kids over here are doing some really cool things. But you know, we have to constantly think about what is the impact on, of what we do on people. Because the impact on what one person does it's very different from the impact on what somebody else might be doing. So that's one reason to care. But if that's not a big enough reason to care, your reputation. So I'm just going to put this there for those who can read it. If you can't read in the back, basically this guy, David Heinmeier Hansen, quite well known in the tech, tech industry. He's applied for a um, Apple, Ap Ap Apple card. So he and his wife have done a joint application both of them got the card approved he gets 20 times more the um allowance than his wife does he goes berserk on twitter there's some choice words in there as you can see um he's not very pleased um there's the next slide which he keeps going on I mean, unfortunately for them the, the people he talks he talks to obviously 
don't really understand the algorithm. They're not the people who built it or maintained it. They can't give many answers. So yeah, he's gone to town on this. I mean, there's, there's a lot more. He's written a lot more than that. But the point is when things go wrong, and even though they're unintentional, people will call you out for things that you're not. So that's a very good reason to care because your reputation is, at, on, is on the line. So now that I've told you all this, because I'm nice, I'm going to give you some tools, some tips on how to kind of deal with these things. Um, so what can we do? Hire ethically minded data scientists. So, you know, when you're going out to look for people to build your models, you know, don't just think about XGBoost, AdaBoost, neural net and all whatnot. Hire people who are thinking about, who realize that there is a human being, there's a customer at the end of every algorithm, right? And they should be thinking about that impact of the work that they do, that it has real life consequences. Senior leaders in your organization, they should care about this because when you get called out on the internet, they will be the ones being, being called out. A lot of times the executives are far removed from these, these things. So yeah, if you're a leader in the organization, you should be, you should pay an interest in, in um, ethics. Diversify your teams. Sometimes people feel a bit awkward with this one because they're like, oh yeah, just give X, Y, Z, A, um, job. Remember, as I said on the first emphasis, it's not about giving just anybody a job. It's about the right candidates, but diversifying your team helps you to see things that might not be obvious to you because of your experiences are very different so here's an example with apple who this is going back ages you know they built the health app but missed out that half of the world might be interested in something okay your data sets so for those of you that work with the um the build the models and all your data sets are very important and sometimes you might not have direct access to um protected characteristics but you just to be knowledgeable enough to see is there anything else that can be used to infer these things so here i'm looking at a map of chicago and the colors are ethnicity and from the map you can see that you can infer people's ethnicity by their address and that's a real thing right so you might not have direct access to the underlying protected characteristics but maybe your data set has it in another form um next up check that your models work for everybody too many times we think about accuracy as an overall but it break it down by groups when you break it down by groups you start to see very interesting things yeah you might have a high accuracy but it's only high dominant group and there's another group in there that they're not as many but the accuracy is really bad so think about breaking it down and it doesn't mean you don't have to use your model just because it doesn't work for all but it means now you know and now you can put in a plan b for the groups that it doesn't work for as opposed to just not know and you know pass the issue on to them start with back office applications so if you're playing around if you're thinking right we want to get our hands you know do some exciting stuff start with stuff that if it goes wrong essentially it affects you it doesn't affect james and john out there right so so yeah that on interventions so i wanted to talk about a few things because there's a few things being talked about or called out on the internet and i just wanted to share my thoughts on them so bias is not the same thing as racism sexism ageism any of the isms right because from what with what we talk about here bias is unintentional it's unconscious those isms are conscious they're intentional right so bias what we we, we are dealing with here is unintentional un unconscious things because i don't believe any organization set out there to say right should we just build an algorithm that is going to annoy group x right it doesn't happen that way at least i don't think it does but 
What I want to talk to you about, right? So this guy, Darren, um, Darren Brown, a few of you might have heard of him. He's an illusionist. So he's kind of done this trick here where he's put a nail under a cup, one of the um, cups. Shuffle the cups round and then ask this lady, ask her to identify the cup with the nail without going near it, without looking, she doesn't know. And for the other two cups where she thinks, thinks the nail isn't under, she needs to slam her hand down on it. So if she gets it wrong, the nail goes through her, her hand, right? So he does all these things, moves it round and asks her, which cup do you think it is in? And she goes, I think it's the red cup in slot one. So obviously, right, she slams her hands down on the other two cups, fine. Absolutely no problem, she got it right. So he says to her, how did you know? And she said, I don't know, it was just a guess. Oh my God, I don't know how I knew it, but it was just a guess. So it turns out throughout the week, he's placed a lot of things in her daily life. Lots of red things, and lots of things with the number one. And throughout the week, she's subconsciously taken in lots of red and number one. And someone's asked her a question and she's gone, yeah, the red cup in number one. And the truth of the matter is all of us are, <laughs> are biased. Every single one of us, that's a fact, right? But we are not responsible for those. And I think that's what, I, well, I don't think we are. It's what our environment has given to us, our experiences, media, what we read, who we hang out with, etc., etc. So I don't think we're responsible for it, but I think we're responsible for knowing what they are. Because when you know what they are, it makes you a better designer because then you know what you don't know, right? And you can look for ways to kind of work around that. So in all of that, if you want to find out a bit more about this, there's some great information out there. There's a documentary on Netflix called Coded, Coded Bias. Great documentary. There's a couple of books here. Weapons of Math, Destruction and Invisible Women. Great material if you want to get a bit more insight into that. If you want it to be a bit more exciting, you could Google Harvard Implicit Bias Test and take the test and some say it's not accurate but it might give you some indication of what your of what your biases are